<laughs> now you know why I got a little word. <laughs> Let's say it because we believe it in this day and age. Amen? Amen. Let's say it together. I, I believe, believe this is a prophetic word of God. I believe in providing this book speaks about my Lord and my Savior Jesus Christ. I desire to read it and to know it in the power of God and the Spirit. Tell me, John, we always. We are by the day. day. We need it. Amen, amen. Open up your Bibles to John chapter 8. And we're going to pick up this morning in verse 44. We've been looking at Jesus addressing the Pharisees. And uh, we looked last week that Jesus began to distinguish two families. And he told them, I am of my Father in heaven. And you are of your Father here on earth. And he began to tell them, and they didn't hear this, that if you abide in me and believe in me, that I will set you free and be free indeed. Amen. And of course their response was, we were never in bondage. What do you mean you set me free? <laughs> and then they began to brag that they were of Abraham's seed. And Jesus began to tell them, if you were of Abraham's seed, why do you seek to kill me? And of course, then Jesus bluntly begins to tell them, in case they missed it, and this is the verse, I'm going through one verse this morning, because I think it's important to educate you about this. And look at verse 44. Jesus tells these religious leaders very bluntly, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. Because the devil's a murderer and they want to kill Jesus. He was a murderer from the beginning and he does not stand in the truth. They heard the truth but they did not receive. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, notice how much our Lord has put into this one verse regarding to this great dark, if you will, of Satanology. And I think a lot of times I'm not here to promote Satan. I'm here to educate you about him. Because people ask, is there really a personal devil? We often are told that the belief in a personal devil, or Satan if you will, is just a relic from the dark ages. And that it is absurd to believe in such a thing as a devil. Some religious, and even the occult, tell you that there is no devil at all. Some religions even say that there is no sin, and that there is no life after death, which is actually a lie of the devil. In fact, if you haven't heard about a man that has started a religion right now, who claims to be Jesus Christ in the flesh, his second coming. He says in 1973, Jesus came to him and empowered him, and he is the second coming of Christ. His followers call him the Son of God in the flesh. His church is called Growing in Grace. He already has over 30 teaching centers throughout the United States and Central America, and he also has a 24-hour TV program and show. Many of his followers call him Daddy, Father, God. He teaches that sin no longer exists, that they are a perfect spirit now. He also teaches that there is no devil, he is just a Hollywood character that is made up. He declares prayer is nothing but a waste of time, and that everybody is wrong, and he's the only one teaching the real truth. His followers are so dedicated to this man, they give all their money to him. One person gave him a mansion, and he sold it for a million dollars. Other people give him automobiles and cars. Here's a man that is under the influence of the devil and he's influenced others of the devil. Matthew 24, 5, Jesus warns us about the last days. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. You know, many times we get wrapped up thinking about the end times and we focus on Israel, which is a, a, a very good point. In the latter days, the end times, Israel will be the focal point of the world, 
And there will be, he will be a thorn to the Middle East, the flesh, the thorn to their flesh. And as we see Syria and Iran and we see Russia and China and we see all these nations begin to ally with each other to stand against Israel, and sorry to say now, the United States ain't doing real good with them right now either, uh, what's taking place. We begin to think, well, there's the end times, but we, we have to remember there's other things showing the end times. And that is false teachers and false prophets that are coming among you. They're like wolves in sheep clothing. You know, we have many religions out there that do not preach Christ and Him crucified. They don't preach Christ coming in the flesh. And so we need to be aware. Jesus says, you know, they're deceiving many. Well, that's because they are under the influence of the great deceiver, the enemy. This morning I want to take a little time because I want to make sure I, I you know, preach the whole counsel of God. And I, I think we need to, to realize that the Satan is alive and well. We have a wonderful father who doesn't slumber or sleep. But remember, the devil neither slumbers or sleeps. He's an eternal spirit. And uh, we'll see in a minute what he is. But my word, this Bible that I read, and I don't understand when I get down here this morning, if someone says, I don't know if there's a real devil, I just can't believe that, then you must just throw the Bible away. Because the Bible and the Old, New, and the Epistle talks nothing about the devil. I mean, talks much about the devil, Satan, and the wicked one. First John 5.19. I'd love you to turn your Bibles, but you can be on the PowerPoint if you want to write them down. Because they got a lot of scriptures. But First John 5.19, listen, it says, We know that we are of God. Now, all who are born again have the Spirit of God, and we have the Comforter. We have the teacher who guides us into our truth. We know we're of God. But it says on the other half of that, but the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And that word sway means swinging or rock or like rocking or swinging a baby to sleep and influencing and controlling them. This is what the wicked one does of the world, rocking them to sleep, teaching them lies. This is why so readily now we see in the world acceptance of the homosexuals on TV and the movies and, and so forth. This is why the world doesn't see anything wrong with aborting a baby because the woman has the right to do that and they don't take no regard to the baby. And we go on and on uh, about what the sway or the enemy is doing within the world, this world. So just where did this wicked one, the devil, Satan, where did he come from? I mean, did God literally create the devil? Because many people go, why did he create the devil in the first place? Well, first of all, no. God did not create the devil. Just where he came from and how he became the wicked one? Well, let's look at some scriptures. Open your Bibles to Isaiah 14. And for you lazy people, it's on the screen. <laughs> and if you want your Bible, and you should have your Bibles, just in case you want to highlight something, we can turn to Isaiah 14, and let's look at verse 12, and we'll read it down to 15. And do something for me. Every time you hear the word, I will, in this verse, is serpent. Now how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of the morning? How are you cast down to the ground, you who weaken the nation? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the far sides of the Lord. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be made like the most high gods. How many I wills did you get? Five. Amen? Look at that man, happy face. Five, I will. This guy has a problem. Doesn't he? So here's what the Lord says to Isaiah. Yet you should be brought down to hell, or Shiloh, to the lowest depths of the pit. In Isaiah. Now if you will, just turn to Ezekiel 28. Because see, 
Obviously, his pride, his sin brought him down, but I'd like you to know what he was before he was the wicked one. All right. Who was this devil and Satan before he became the wicked, evil one that we all know? Well, in Ezekiel 28, we read verse 14. He says, you were the anointed cherubim. That's one of the hierarchies of all angels here. Cherubim. Who covers. I establish you. In other words, God's taken full claim that he created him. That he created him an anointed cherub. Mm -hmm. You were on the holy mountain of God. He dwelled with God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in all your ways from the day you were created. You were perfect. But what happened? What does it say? Until iniquity was found in you. Now go down to verse 17 there, just a couple of verses. Listen, why? Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. So you know, Satan isn't what you really, I mean, Hollywood does betray him pretty wicked, but we're going to be, the Bible says we will be amazed when we see Satan and say, is this the one that man is feared? And in reality, he was a very beautiful being, a very beautiful cherub. Uh, we read in another portion of Ezekiel that he was a worship leader. He played the pipe, the harp, in heaven. You know? I can see why the worship team always gets attacked. Because God loves the praises of his people. He loves the worship. Let me tell you something. If you come here and you're thinking worship is a time to come late, naughty on you. <laughs> Worship is to prepare your heart to receive the Word of God. Yeah. My worship team is like the plow that will turn the soil of your heart and heart, or your heart that dismay. Turn that while you're worshiping, open it up, so when the Word comes forth, you can just receive it and get blessed by it. But you, because of your beauty, you corrupt your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. And Luke 10 18, we hear Jesus himself say, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. You don't think God was grieved when he created such a beautiful being that he began to think highly and proudly of himself? Never think too highly of yourself. Let me tell you people, let's, let's learn something good too. Not only learn about who the devil is, but let's learn about ourselves. When we begin to think we know everything and we're too good for people, we're too blessed for somebody else or we're better than they. You're walking on the dangerous footsteps of the words of Satan because of his beauty, because of his wisdom, because of his splendor. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us knowledge puffs up, but love. Can't beat that, eh? Chuck Smith always told me, you know, uh, Little man of God. Okay. That's what happened in 69. You know, it's like that preacher wanted to make that real good point. You know, oh boy, I finally come to that point. And he goes, and I just want to tell you. Yeah, I did it to you. Okay. Amen? Amen. Amen. Revelation 12, 19. It says, so the great dragon was cast out. Now, this wicked now, he's found iniquity now. Sin came in the world. It's almost like Adam, pure in the eyes of God, walking in the, in the, in the shadow of the Lord, in the garden of Eden, in, in the day, didn't fellowship with God until sin, sin entered in. And there was no more fellowship. Thank God we have redemption through Jesus Christ. But this great dragon was cast out, we read in Revelation, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. A third of the angels of God, can you imagine that? A third of the angels of God cast out of heaven with the devil. Satan is such a deceiver that he would keep convinced a third of God's holy angel to follow him out. 
and to try to stand against God. So don't think He can't deceive you. Don't think He can't lie to you. Never think you stand lest you fall. Be very careful. Realize your status, your butt vapor, your flesh, and your strength is in God. And the moment you begin to fall away from God, the moment you begin to, to do your own thing, and trust your own reasoning, hanging around the wrong people, and not around godly people, not getting into the Word and say, watch out, you're, you're getting ready to fall, and great will that fall be. And it doesn't mean like a child of God will lose their salvation. But boy, think how much you'll lose, maybe, of the testimony of your faith in God. How the world will look at you in the perspective of God as they look at you and how you react. And so we need to be very careful. We read in 2 Corinthians 4 that He is the God of this age. You know, He's now here. He's cast down the earth. He's now attacking us. We need to be ready. He is our adversary, as we're going to see. And the first man He begins to attack when He's here is Job. Now, we're not going to get into Job, but I want to read you something here, because remember, we're looking, is the devil real? We know God didn't create him, right? We know God created him a perfect being. You got that? Amen. He was a cherub, a perfect being, but yet his self-will, his pride, he began to stink. He was better than God. He doesn't need God. Matter of fact, he can do better than God and try to take the throne of God. But that didn't happen. God cast him down to the earth, and now he's here. And he's in the domain of earth, our atmosphere, here on earth, the clouds in the universe right in here. We all read the Bible, the, you know, the first, the second, third heaven. First heaven is for us dwelling in the air, the second heaven, if you will, it is the atmosphere, the space, and the third heaven is where God dwells. And so Satan has, if you will, control of the first and second in God dwells. But at, right at this time, Satan still has access to God. And we see here in Job, 1, 6, and 7, Now uh, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, Jehovah, and Satan also came among them, and the Lord said to Satan, So, is Satan real? Well, I hope so, because God is having a conversation with him. So either God is talking to himself, or he has an imaginary friend. <laughs> so, we see here, if God is talking to Satan every day, he must be pretty real. And then we see also in Zechariah 3, 1 and 2, Then the angel showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, the accuser, another name for him, Satan, was there at the angel's right hand, making accusations against this man, Joshua. And the Lord again said to Satan, I, the Lord, reject your accusations, Satan. And so we see again, God is now, not only that, but he's, re, he's rebuking Satan for the accusations. Remember, he's the accuser, but God doesn't receive the accusations of the devil from his, uh, of his children. Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus led us straight by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So he's in the wilderness. The devil comes to him. And look at 4.10, the end of his temptation. Jesus finally says to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only you shall worship. So, now we would start to get an understanding of this guy. He's up there talking bad about you. He's up there accusing you before God. Now, if you have Jesus Christ, He will not receive that. Because even though this false prophet tells us that your perfect spirit you know, and there's no sin. We have to realize in the flesh dwells no good thing, right? We're born again, right? The Spirit of God in us, right? We're sealed by God, right? The love of God is poured in our hearts by the Holy Spirit in Romans, right? Okay, so, you are, in God's eyes, righteous. So when the devil comes to try to accuse you, God doesn't see you in your same state. He sees you in Christ Jesus. So God says, I have no problem with these perfect before my eyes. And he doesn't receive the accusation. And so we need to realize that. But we also need to realize that we've got to be careful. Because we have the Spirit of God in us, but we're still sin nature. We do stupid things, right? Yes. Right? You speed, right? <laughs> yes. You all speed. You all do rolling stop signs, don't you? <laughs> 
I stop. That was you did. How did you think? <laughs> I just take me love. I can drive. I can probably follow you, follow me around and say, "Yep, he's a sinner." <laughs> <laughs> but I'm so glad I'm saved by the Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> In Acts 26, again now. Now we saw in the Old Testament the evidence of the Satan, the devil. You know, and this is very important because we're working towards a doctrine here. If it was just mentioned in the Old Testament, we couldn't really state it as a doctrine yet. Okay, but now we saw it in the Gospels. Jesus Christ taught, tempted by the devil. So we see Satan mentioned and the devil mentioned in the Gospels too. So that's two evidences. Now, once we see it in the letters and the epistles, then it's doctrine. In other words, it's fact. And here we see it in Acts. 26, 17, and 18, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from the darkness to the light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who sanctify my faith in me. So one of the purposes, you know, is that the gospel is to take us out of the bondage and the snare of the enemy's hand. You know, if you're not born again here, I mean, you're going to realize you're still in bondage. You need to give your life to Jesus Christ. Don't you want to be set free? Yeah. I mean, don't you want to live a life in God and be who you want to be in God and have a family of God? I am so blessed. You know, my daughter Sunday, I remember this a, a few years ago, she was always wondering, you know, gee, Dad, I don't know, I go to church, I don't really feel sometimes. And, and boy, you know, she just wasn't getting it yet because she was still influenced, if you will, by a lot of thoughts of the world. But boy, once she committed and surrendered to God once and for all, and she got on fire for God, and now just to see all the love for the body of Christ and all that you do, I mean, it is wonderful to have a good family. And we got a good family. Amen? Amen. So is the devil real? Well, we read it in the Old Testament. We read it in the Gospels. And we're reading in the Epistles. We'll see in a minute. And the Epistles are going to tell us how to stand against the devil. And when we speak of Satan and the devil, it becomes doctrine and once again, fact. So yes, there is a real devil. Yes, Satan is alive in the well. Yes, Satan is a liar. Yes, Satan is a destroyer. And yes, Satan is a murderer, which Jesus mentioned in verse 44. And that's what we're looking at to confirm Jesus' word that you would be aware of as Christians. Mm -hmm. That you need to realize that if you're not walking in the light, then you're fellowshipping with something else, and it's not good. Stay on course. Amen? Amen. This is what? A lamp to your feet, a light to your path. And then we all know what it is to walk in the darkness without flashlights. So we need to realize this is our light. Everything we need to know is in this book. Don't stray from it. Now look at here. I want to read you some names you're familiar with, you know, so you don't get confused. And uh, I got it on the screen because I don't think you can turn your Bibles this quick to these verses. But look at what he's called. He's called the dragon, the old serpent in Revelation 12, 9, also in Revelation 22. And the prince of this world, we read it in John 12, 31, and John 14, 30. <clears throat> the prince of the power of the air, we read that in Ephesians 2, 2. He is influencing the philosophy of the world. This is why we see so much corruption in the world today. You know, everybody's leaning toward his philosophy, but we have the truth. He's the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. We read that. You know, and God cast him down. There's now he's the prince of this world, he's the God of this world. He says he, he is, you know, his ministers are ministers of righteousness. And like I said this morning, this guy of, of uh, you know, this growing in grace guy, he, you know, he's, he's a minister of the enemy. He acts like a minister of righteousness, but he's of the devil. And there's many of him, he's just one. But thank God to know who you are in God. Amen? Amen. And he says here, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, Ephesians 2, 2. Now, whether you realize it or not, brothers and sisters, I mean, we know it, but if you're here today and you don't have Christ, you probably don't like to 
idea of this, but this is what the Bible is telling you. If, you. if you're going to have any concept of what the Bible says, the Bible clearly tells you that if you're not a child of God, you are a child of the devil. Right now, the devil is your father. You can't say, our father which art in heaven, because your father is not in heaven. Your father is just what the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus told them, your father is of the devil. And that's how to be seen. People are very offended to say that. But I'm educating you today. I'm not here to condemn anybody. I'm telling you that you, this day, can come into being a family of the enemy, influenced by the devil, if you will, children of disobedience, to children of obedience, accepting Christ, born again, and coming to their family of God. And then if rapture comes, you're coming with us. You know, because you're here. You're, you're, you're done. Now, I can preach on this four hours. You know that, right? So you want me to? I, I just want to know that I give you enough scripture to defend you at least this morning that there's a real Satan, that there's a real devil, and he's the wicked one. And if you're not of the family of God, then you're simply the family of the Father and the Father doing His will. And people often ask me, is, if there is a devil, then why would a good, loving God create him? And a good, loving God, as we talked about, did not create him. The being God created was pure, perfect, and innocent. As we saw in Isaiah 14, 12, an angel who had fallen by his own choice, by his own decision and pride in his heart. He was called Lucifer, which simply meant, as you saw, the morning star, a glorious being that dwelt in the presence of God, that his pride, he fell, his self-will, you know, an expression of it. And then the angel became what we now know, a demon, a devil, you know, and he has many, many powers that he is over. You know, we have God and angels, we have angels that be with us, but let me tell you that the devil has his demon. You know, the devil can't be everywhere at once. So don't think the devil's out the wrong time. You know, but he has you on his scopes, and so he sends his troops out to get you and to try to destroy your faith. Because the devil simply means a slander. So he wants to make you look in the eyes of the world. So now, it, the slander, he wants to slander you as Christians. Like, it drives me crazy when I see Christians on TV do stupid things, acting crazy, representing my God, representing Christianity. You know, and, and, and it's just, God help us. Satan means adversary, the devil. And, and he's, he's combined both in himself. He is your slanderer and he is your adversary. And he's the one that accuses us before God. But you know what? He also accuses God to us. Be very careful when you hear these voices in your head. And when you begin to tell God, God, I thought you loved me. God, I thought you said you would help me. You're slandering God. These are thoughts of the enemy. Your thoughts of me, God, I know you can help me. God, I know you'll always help me. God, I know you'll love me. God, I know you'll trust me. This will be there for me. So when you start hearing thoughts like that, and I know sometimes we can get depressed or, or we can get a tragic hits our lives, you know, and we can spontaneously say, oh my God, I've not been this happened to me. But be very careful. Because I'll tell you, it would be a lot better if we just praise God of our trials and tribulations. Paul says, you know, I rejoice in my trials and tribulations. I, and I, I read that and go, Paul's sick. But you know what? That's because I didn't get it then. But now I understand what Paul means. I understand what he means. He says, you know what? When I'm made weak, that's when I'm made strong. Because God knows me better than myself. And so he keeps me close to him. In some ways he does it, I don't like it sometimes. Right? So he takes me through that. And so Satan here, what does he want to do? Well, he wants to accuse you of God of having faith in him. He wants to accuse you of God doesn't love you. He wants to accuse you of build out of this. We all been there, right? We all know that. Yeah. And we do, I'm just here to educate you. I'm just here to, as a pastor to tell you, you know what, to believe me, I, I don't like talking about this guy. I had enough problems just me talking about him and studying him. You know, but I do know one thing. Now that you are educated about him, now that you're going to be educated about him, you continue to educate yourself about him, you know, he's not going to be happy. You're probably saying thanks a lot, Jim. 
Now when I leave the place, it's got a really attack me to see if my fate will be small. <laughs> Stand strong, stay the course. And remember, he's the accuser of the brethren, so don't you be that. I bet this everybody here almost, directly or indirectly, probably has been affected by a, a split in the church. And you know how the splits happen? Gossip, accusations, slanderous, speaking about somebody, and so forth, and then the rumor, then the enemy gets that, and he begins to, like, leaven, begins to, the yeast begins to infect the whole body, and next thing you know, people are leaving the body, and leaving the church, and churches are being split. That's the devil. That's not God. God should strive to keep the peace, keep the unity. Hang in there. Hold fast. You know, if you're going to leave a church, do like we do here many times. We, we have you come up and let us pray you out. You're moving? Go out. All right, you pastor. Then just leave quietly. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> you don't have to call me up and say, I left the church because I hate you. <laughs> okay. God bless you. Thank God you're under God's grace. <laughs> Don't come out of my house again. I want your own. I'm kidding. Some of these new people are saying, man, this pastor gets down. Right? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Actually, that used to bother me. And, and God really spoke to me one time. You know, it, it, we are embellished on things. Things are mostly, if we take a moment here, we can just make it a giant. Uh, yeah. You know, and so sometimes you get two, three couples in the church, right? And, and all of a sudden you hear people go, everybody's leaving the church. Everybody's going away. We got like three couples left. And so I'm like, oh my God, it's going to be like a snowball. Soon, there'll be nobody left. You know, and, and then the Lord just spoke in some cases. You know what, Jim? First of all, I'm the chief shepherd. You're just an under shepherd. You're just one of the dogs here that keep the shepherd in mind. The sheep dog, Jim. And, and he said, but here's the thing, Jim. I'll take care of them. You focus on the one that stayed. And preach and educate the ones that stayed. I'll take the ones that leave. And we need to realize that. Because we need to stop accusing people. And it's not good for the body. Titus 3, 1 and 2 simply says this, Remind them to be subject to rules and authority, to obey, to be ready for every good work, but listen, to speak evil of no one. What we need to do is to be peaceable, to be gentle, to be showing of all humility to all men. And James, the same thing, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. So we speak like that, right? We need to realize that, that we are actually taking the character of the enemy, the accuser. And so the devil was an apostate. He, in other words, he abides not in the truth. He turned away from the truth. In the last days, that's one of the signs that we're going to see again. It's not only that false Christ will come up, false prophets, but apostate. People will leave the faith. In the last days, it says people will not endure sound doctrine. I hear people tell Calvary, you know, you Calvary Chapel guys, now that's how you do is preach the word. And I'm like, <laughs> Pop me, I, I don't know. I could dance. I don't know. I used to be a gymnastic, I could stand on my hands. I, I'm like, you know, Lord, you just don't let the spirit move. You don't let the spirit flow. Like, what is this? The Spirit right now is teaching, He's moving, He's equipping, He's convicting, He's encouraging, whatever He's doing to each and every one of you right now. Some of you might be saying, I don't like what He's doing right now, church with you. Some of you might be saying, oh my, thank you, Jim, I needed that. But we're not here to entertain you, even though sometimes I do. <laughs> Amen? Amen. And so, yes. And you know what? I will never... God help me go astray from this world. If you're going to be here at Calvary Chapel, you're going to hear the truth and nothing but the truth. Because we need it these days. Because there's too many deceivers out there. Didn't Jesus 
says he's a murderer. That word means manslayer. He's out there to slay you. There's no truth in him, we are told. He speaks lies. He's, he speaks of his own nature. He's a father of lies. You know? And so we need to still Now, turn to 1 Peter 5. You need to draw some things out. I hope you don't have a lunch party. I hope there goes one of my assistants. Okay, well, God bless you. <laughs> when your assistant leaves, I don't know what to say now. No, and listen, look at 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, it's on the screen, but I want to, two words I want us to really look at. Remember, first he said, 1 Peter, these two things you need to do before you can do the other half. In other words, be sober. And that word means not intoxicated with anything except the Word of God. Don't be influenced by anything else. It says you need to have a clear head and to be serious. And so we don't want to influence ourselves with the philosophy of the world or anybody else that is out of Christ. That's why I always encourage you to fellowship with those in Christ that you can always look through the Word and be in fellowship in the Word. So we need to realize to be, have a sober mind is not to be influenced or intoxicated like a drunk is intoxicated and becomes a different person. You know, you should be Christ-like and Christ-like only and not intoxicated or influenced by anything else. Even me, you don't be influenced by me, influenced by what I say through the Word. You know, and, and, and you know what, the only thing I love that if you're going to copy me is I follow Christ, you follow me, you know, is to love one another. Because yeah. you know, we need love this week for world. <laughs> And so we want to be intoxicated in the Word, you know, and be clear-headed. I'm going to tell you something. If, if you're confused, you need to either look into the Scriptures about something and find out the truth, what it means, or ask. Ask one of the pastors. I'm not quite concerned. I'm not quite understanding what you're saying. So you've got to have a clear head. You don't want to think, well, I think the Bible says this. We should not say, I think. We should know what the Bible says. And if we don't, you just ask, are you looking up? Amen? Yeah. You're giving your homework. Look it up. Right? Right. Now you're not going to find out how to cook spaghetti and meatballs in here. <laughs> but there's certain things you can look up. And look at that. It says be vigilant. That is, in other words, be watchful, alert, be on guard, observe, be cautious. You know, some people don't go to sleep in your Christian walk. Remember, we're talking about a warfare here. You're on the enemy's turf here. He's the prince of the world. He's the god of this world. You're on his turf. You know, that's why God says your citizenship is not here. It's in heaven. So we're not citizenship of the world. We're in the world, but we should be of the world because the world is of the influence of the devil. And so we want to be influenced of him, right? So why should we be so diligent looking now? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion Seeking whom he may devour. Now he walks about like a boring guy, a lion. I always picture him a lion with no teeth. He's trying to gum me to death. But, you know, but he does scare people, right? I mean, lions scare people. And that's what he'll try to do. And God is greater than he. And what dwells in us is greater than he is in the world. And so what do we say here? Well, we need to resist him steadfast in the faith. Now, we know what the faith means, right? Faith in God that God is able to do it, and God has everything in control, knowing that the same suffering experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Isn't that funny? Not only do we all experience this, but he says your brotherhood in the world. You know, God, it, it, the sun shines on the just and the unjust. It rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. Problems happen. You know, people tell me, well, I did that. I don't have God, and I got through it. Well, good for you. I got through it, but God got me through it. And I was able to glorify God through it. So our whole idea is my life is to bring glory to God, health and sickness of rich and poor. Amen? Amen. We're his bride. Okay, now, let's close. Look at Ephesians 6. <coughs> this is it. So this is one way we learned about the devil. What are we supposed to do? Well, 1 Peter 5, 8, 9. And of course, we all know Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, what do we need to do? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of whose might? Yes, his might. Don't count to ten. 
You know, take your computer, I can do it, I can do it. Get all those little stories you heard when you were kids, the little train going up the hill. No, you can't do it. It's through the power of His might. We know the power of the enemy, we know His resources, we know He's eternal, and we know that He's very deceiving. And so we need to realize, so I don't fight Him with my mind or with Him, but I fight Him with, with, with God's mind. So what do I do? I put on the armor of God. And why? That I may be able to stand against Him. If you don't have the armor of God, you're already defeated. This is put on the armor of God that you may be able to stand against Him. So let's continue. Why? Well, because you're not wrestling against flesh and blood. It's, it, this is not somebody you can punch in the mouth and get him away from you. You know, this is somebody you can't see. This is somebody that can be right in your he's waiting outside for. Alright, and so what does he say? Well, you don't wrestle against flesh and blood, what do we do? You're wrestling, you're wrestling against what? Principalities? Great. Against powers. That's that sounds like what? That sounds like power, right? Oh, against powers. Against the ruler of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places, spiritual hosts of wickedness. We are soldiers of the Lord. We have angels to fight with us and the Lord to fight for us. But we need to realize our adversary, our, the devil, the, the wicked, whatever you want to call him, he also has his army and hosts. And every day he's planning. You know, uh, do you think the devil knows you? How many of you know the devil's older than you? <laughs> huh? You're a long time, huh? But this is why it cracks me up when people go, Oh my God, I went to see a medium and he told me everything. He told me stuff that I didn't even know, that my dad knew. <laughs> wow! <laughs> this guy's really got it together. No, the devil's telling him what to say. <laughs> he doesn't know nothing. That medium doesn't know nothing. The devil knows your, your granddad, dad, great, 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 you know, your, your ancestry. He has more leads than you can imagine. You don't listen to people oh, like somebody told me things I thought I'd never do. I mean, really help. Okay. Move on along. So what do we do? Well, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. You know, how many of you... Guys, really. I mean, you're, you're going to church. You get up, right? You're in bed. You know, get your underwear on. And you put your shirt on, nice shirt. And I come to church with no pants. <laughs> Would anybody say anything to me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jim, you forgot your shoes. <gasps> no way. <laughs> and your pants. Oh, that's embarrassing. Or even if I came up here in pants and didn't have my shirt on to show my physique and my muscle. Why are you laughing about that? Come on now. Don't be out here. I hope you for 45 minutes. And, and you know what? So you need to put on, you need to realize the whole, the whole arm of God that you'll be able to stand against the wrath of the devil. We do not wrestle. We know the powers. Take up the whole arm of God that you'll be able to withstand the evil day. In verse 13, having done all to stand, stand therefore, and then he gives you the equipment. You know, girding your waist with the truth, having on our guidance teach for this for another. Putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Having sawed your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith which you, <clears throat> with which you will quench the fiery, all the fiery dots. That word in the Greek is missile, literally. Missile of the wicked one. And take up the heaven of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The sword, I love it. Praying always with all prayer and supplications in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication, we should be praying for all of us, everyone. And here I, I ask you, this is personal for me, do this for me. As for Jim, that others may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel, for which I am ambassador in chains. I thank God I'm not in chains, but I am an ambassador that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. 
but I'll compromise and shame. I'm going to have the worship team come forward. So we need to be in the truth. We need not to fear the power of the enemy, even though we know him. Second Corinthians it says, Our weapons are not common, but mighty through God, putting down strongholds. If we put on the whole armor of God, we can resist him successfully. And I want to just close for us to remember and for the devil to remind him of his future. And it's in Revelation 20.10. It says the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire, the brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the bottom line, the devil will be dealt with accordingly, as well as that false prophet I mentioned, any other false prophet or teacher in there. But as for us, we will be raptured. One way or another, we're getting to heaven. When you rapture, the joy, whatever means you want. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'm asking today, because we're running long. And if you don't know Jesus Christ today, I don't want you to be children of disobedience anymore. I want you to be children of the Heavenly Father. That you can wake up and say, Our Father, we're child of heaven, how will we die in heaven? And if you want that this morning, it's very simple. You need to be born again. If you're not born again, you are on high risk. Because if rapture comes, you stay. If you die, you go directly to hell. And you don't pass through. You know, so this is a time not to fool around, but time to be serious. A time to say, I need Jesus Christ in my life. Look around. You see the signs that are happening. I mentioned a few of them. People, what do you realize is not on the high? You cannot recognize it. The Lord is coming. We are at hand. He's ready to blow the trumpet. He's looking at his father to snatch his church away. And the only next thing that has to be fulfilled is the church being taken out before Russia invades Israel and the Antichrist is revealed. And if you want Jesus Christ today, we don't close eyes, we don't be embarrassed. You shouldn't be embarrassed to have God in your life. Christ went to the cross absolutely naked and endured the shame for you. So can you really stand for him today? Because Jesus says, if you deny me before man, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. But if you acknowledge and confess me before man, then I'll confess you before my Father and the angels in heaven. And if you want that today, I'm asking you right now to stand and let me pray for you. If you want Christ in your life. Is anybody here before we close to accept Jesus Christ? If you have a question, if you're not sure, do you want to make sure you get into heaven? I'm asking you to stand. Anybody? Gracious Father, thank you so much that your children, dear Father, was able to listen to what you had to say to them today. Very difficult subject. But dear Father, now we know as we move on in the Gospel of John. And dear Father, help us to always remember to put on the arm of God that we will be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. Let the children go out of here, dear Father, bold, empowered, reassured that they are your children and part of your army in these last days. And bless each and every one of them we do pray. Jesus' name. And we all agree and say, Amen. Amen. And if you need prayer this morning, we have prayer parties. Come on up. Maybe you have a lot of you want to pray for. Or something in your life this message spoke to you about. God bless you. Let's all stand.